Okay, so we're starting. Good morning, sabach el khir, v'boker tov to all of you who came here today for the third Charuv International Conference. We're thrilled and happy to have you with us for those two days. And we were waiting for you for two years, right? Because the world decided to get all crazy and there were chaos all around. Uh, so there was COVID and wars and a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of traumas everywhere. Uh, but we're here this morning together welcoming you to a two days of, we hope, will be inspiration for you. We'll provide you a platform for networking from colleagues in Israel and colleagues abroad. Um, and we're really looking forward to meet and engage with each and every one of you. Shortly, I will say a big thank you first of all, to the fabulous Charuv team who worked so hard to this conference, led by Tali Shlomi. Where is Tali Shlomi? Tali Shlomi. And by the one who all of you corresponded with her at least 100 times, Il Il. Thank you so much for your amazing efforts in making this reality for all of us. And I would also like to thank to the scientific committee, to Dr. Anat Talmon, Dr. Noga Tsur, Dr. Adi Stern, and Dr. Eran Melkman. <laughs> thank you so much for your hard work in re reviewing all the abstract and organizing for us a great and quality workshop, conference, sorry. Okay, and now I would like to invite Professor Asher ben -Arie the director of Haruv Institute and the dean of the Faculty of Social Work at the Hebrew University. Thank you, you Kermit, and good morning, everybody. I'm really happy to be here for two reasons. First of all, because when we started working on the idea of an international conference here in Jerusalem about seven or eight years ago, uh, I would probably imagine or I would say that the audience would be much smaller. The amount of people who were doing research and, co and identifying themselves as researchers in the area of child maltreatment was much smaller 10 years ago or 12 years ago when I took over Haruv. And that amount is growing and more and more of the research community in Israel is understanding that the topic of child maltreatment and research in the area of child maltreatment is different than the general research in child welfare and is different than uh, more traditional topics of re research, residential care in itself, and so on. And in this third conference, I see a lot of fruits from the trees we planted. And therefore, I must tell you why the Haruv Institute is named the Haruv Institute. Where did the name came from? The name came from the Karub tree. Karub is a Karub tree in Hebrew. And the Karub tree is the symbol of the Schusterman Foundation, which founded the Karub Institute and is still funding the Karub Institute very generously. And the reason they chose the Karub tree as their symbol goes back to an old Jewish myth or legend. Some would say it's about the elder Hillel, some would say it's about another elder, but I will stick with Hillel. And the story says that when Hillel went in the north of Israel, in the Galilee, he saw an old man planting a carob tree. And in the legend it says that the carob tree would give you fruits only 70 years after you plant it. I'm not sure it's 70, but I've checked and it's a long period. It doesn't give fruits within four or five years. So it's probably 30 or 25 years. And then he asked the, this elder who was planting the carob tree, why are you planting the tree? You won't enjoy the fruits. And the answer of the elder who planted the tree was, he's like, he's doing what his parents and grandparents have done for him. He's planting the tree today so his children and grandchildren will enjoy the fruits in future days. So the Schusterman Foundation took the carob tree and the fact that you invest today for the next generation as their symbol, and they gave us that name, and that's why we are called the Charub Institute. And when I said that I'm so happy to see the audience here, 
It has to do, first of all, with the size and the amount of people who are doing research. And second is also with the growing group of former postdocs of Haruv. We started 10 years ago or 11 years ago a very interesting project where every year we are sending between one to four young researchers who finish their dissertation, not necessarily in the area of child maltreatment. We shift them to focus on child maltreatment. We send them fully funded for one year for a postdoc abroad, and then they come back, most of them, or almost all of them, and apply for a tenure track position in universities. And we have more than 25 of them already in Israel, and a very big group of them is here. So that's another thing that really moves me when I see the audience here, and in different professions. We have people here who were Harub postdoc in education, and we have people who were in social work, and in psychology, and in occupational therapy, and you'll probably meet a lot of them during the lectures and of a different panel. So with that, I don't want to say too much, but just to mention the last thing I wanted to talk with you about, and it relates directly to the first plenary, and how happy I am that David Olds has joined us, is going to give the first plenary because David is probably the researcher that, uh, that is focused on prevention of child maltreatment for uh, two or three years at least, right, David? <laughs> Starting in the 65 or 66 in Almera. That was the first study I know. Yeah, 77. 77. Okay. So, when we speak about research and we speak about child maltreatment, my, my quote usually says the following. First of all, we know today that it's a much more complex phenomenon than what we thought in the past. It's not just a medical or just a social or just an economical complex. It's a multi-facet, multi-professional problem. We could only deal with it in a multi-professional perspective. That's the first thing. The second thing is that we know way more on how to treat victims of child maltreatment. We've done lots of advancement. Not always we succeed, but we know. We know relatively well how to identify children who were maltreated. Here it's more an issue of spreading the word and educating the people. We don't know enough how to prevent child maltreatment. And the big challenge that all of us needs to face is to follow David Old's uh, footsteps and to have a better sense and better tools and have more efforts on how to prevent child maltreatment and not only how to treat the victims after we identify them. I wish you all a very successful conference. I'm sure it's going to be enriching. The most important thing is probably the discussions that you will have in the panels and between the panels during breaks. And I hope that all of you would become part of the bigger Haruv network, or as I call it, the bigger Haruv family. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asher, and I am honored to invite our chair for this plenary, Professor Abigail Gwirtz, who is a leading scholar in our community, but also, luckily for us, a dear friend and colleague. She is a professor in the School of Social Work at the Hebrew University and in the Department of Psychology and Rich Institute in Arizona State University. Abigail will chair this plenary session. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's really a treat to be here, and it is such a pleasure to introduce David. Um, so I'm Abby Gewertz. I am a researcher in prevention and in parenting, and so I know how hard it is to develop, test, and implement an evidence-based parenting program. So David, I told my students last week in our class here upstairs, um, I said, imagine that uh, there's a river and uh, you see babies falling into the river, right? And you're, you're walking down the river and you see these babies floating, you know, drowning in the river. What do you do? And the student said, you know, you run and you grab them and you pull them out, right? But they keep coming. They keep coming. So then what do you do? Well, you run upstream 
to where the hole in the fence is, where the babies are falling in. And that's what David has done for the last, what, uh, I don't know, I won't count the number of years. Maybe better not to. 46, thank you. Um, so uh, David Olds is a professor at the University of Colorado, and he is the developer of the Nurse Family Partnership. If you want to know more about him, there's a very inspiring story on his website, nursefamilypartnership.org. Um, for his, he has spent his career dedicated to uh, positive ways to prevent child maltreatment and promote well-being among first-time mothers and their babies. Um, I'm not going to take away the thunder from you, so I'm just going to say it's such a pleasure to introduce you. As I mentioned, this is my second time introducing David. I had, a, I had the pleasure of introducing him at the University of Minnesota 10 years ago. He said he's got some new stuff to talk about, so uh, I don't know how you're going to talk about 46 years of work in one uh, presentation, but welcome and thank you. Thank you, Abby and Asher and Carmit. I truly appreciate your um, in inviting me to this uh, wonderful conference. And I, um, I want to start with just a little bit of an apology. I have a hearing loss, and my hearing aids broke last night. And so if, you, um, if I sound like I'm a little out of it, you now know what my wife has to put up with all the time. Um, really, my wife and I, Carla, has spent the last three weeks exploring this wonderful country, Israel. Um, and it reflects in such a deep way our shared human aspirations to make it a better place. But it's also filled with conflict, which also both of those uh, characteristics reflect our, the, the, our shared human dilemma and opportunities, I think. But I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful because of the work of the Haruv Institute. I'm hopeful because of the work that all of you in this room today are conducting. Um, it recognizes and supports our shared human drive to protect our children. And you know something? Um, that gives me hope for the future. Thank you for um, finding a, a place for us to share and contemplate our opportunities to really, in the most fundamental ways, make the world a a better place. Um, today I'm going to share with you um, work that our team has conducted over the last 46 years, um, developing and testing and replicating a program of prenatal and early childhood home visiting by nurses. And um, But before I start that, I'm going to start with a little personal story. If I can, I think I've got this. Ta da, it does, it works. Um, I grew up in a small town in Ohio, in the United States, on, 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 the, on Lake Erie and the Pennsylvania border. Um, and this is a picture of my family. Um, does this work? I don't know. I, I think I can do it this way. Yeah, mm, yeah, it's not a great cursor, but you can see this. This is my mother holding my younger, my mother Winnie, holding my younger sister Kathy. And this is my father, Bob. And this is me holding our cat, Josie. 
Uh, the picture is taken by my grandmother, Elsie. My grandmother, Elsie, was a quietly religious person. My mother worked in a factory a block and a half behind our house. And my grandmother and I would sleep on the floor in the winter above the furnace room in our house so that we could stay warm in the winter. Um, as, a young, as a young adolescent, I developed an interest in poor children in Africa and India and wanting to do something about their plight. So I applied to the Johns Hopkins School for Advanced International Studies and they gave me a scholarship. I have no money at all. They gave me a scholarship and early admissions. And when I got to Hopkins in 1966, it was clear to me that that program, the School for Advanced International Studies program, was all about containing Soviet aggression in Eastern Europe and communism in Southeast Asia. And I realized it just didn't speak to me. Look, those things are really important, but it didn't speak to my heart. So I started taking courses with a professor at Hopkins named Mary Ainsworth. How many of you know of the work of Mary Ainsworth? Yes. Well, I, did, I both took courses with her and helped code some of the, the early observations of parent, infant, mother, infant interaction. And, um, and I started to realize that, of course, she was taking John Bowlby's attachment theory and operationalizing it and developing the empirical foundations for that work. That was starting to speak to me. And so um, when I graduated from Hopkins in 1970, I went to work in an inner city daycare center um, where I taught four-year-olds. And one of the things that struck me um, immediately was that there was a little boy in our classroom who couldn't sleep at nap time. And one day a teach another teacher and I took him down to a, another classroom and asked him, hey, wh wh how come you can't sleep? And he said, you know, after cursing us out, he said, you know, when I sleep, I wet myself. And when I wet myself, my mom beats me. So for him, it was simply safer not to sleep at all. Another little boy in my classroom couldn't speak. He only gestured. And it turns out that his biological mother had been involved in the drug culture, and she was an alcoholic. And, the, um, and it was evident that those prenatal experiences had compromised his neurodevelopmental functioning. And so I set up parent group meetings to meet with parents while in the afternoon while children slept. And the striking thing to me about this was it was the parents of the children I was least compared, uh, concerned about who showed up. It was the children of the parents of children I was most concerned about I never saw. And so I realized that we needed to do more. But after that, I also realized that families were having to contend with terrible conditions. This was in West Baltimore in 1970, and the, uh, the, the context was terrible. The, the, uh, there were no supermarkets with fresh fruits and, and uh, fruits and vegetables. The rates of unemployment were off the charts. The housing stock was terrible. The park where we would take children to play was unsafe. There were high rates of crime in the neighborhood. I could go on about this, but I only have 45 minutes today. But I started reading of a, a, another professor while the children were sleeping named Yuri Bronfenbrenner. I don't know whether you know Yuri Bronfenbrenner, but he d was developing his theory of human ecology to understand the material and social influences on parenting and child development. And so I wrote to Yuri on a yellow pad and he wrote back to me. And I ended up 
going to Cornell for my PhD and working with Yuri as my mentor. Um, I, after, uh, after graduating from Cornell in 1976, I went to work, while I was working on my dissertation, I went to work in a nonprofit organization in a small community south of Ithaca, New York, called Elmira. And in Elmira, I uh, was offered a job to evaluate a program of sensory and developmental screening for children in the community. And so I took the job, and, but I talked to the agency director and I said to him, you know something, I'm gonna do the evaluation for you as you need to get this report to the federal government. But I have to tell you, I have my doubts about whether it really works. And given the way this, this evaluation is, is set up, we won't know for sure whether it really works. And I said, if you will allow me to use part of my time with working with you to develop a program that I think might make a difference and set it up in the form of a study that will tell us with much greater confidence whether it's great really working, um, that would be great. And John Shannon, the agency director, said, go at it, go for it. And so I um, developed the, with a lot of help from a lot of people over the years, uh, this program of prenatal and early childhood home visiting by nurses for low income mothers with no previous live births. And we focused in the original trial on women who were either teenaged, low income, or unmarried at that time uh, in the original trial. And we tried to be really clear about what it is that we're trying to accomplish here. And how are we gonna go about doing this, both in terms of behavioral objectives and the methods that nurses would use to engage and support and promote adaptive behavioral functioning in the parents, the mothers primarily, um, served by the program. And I think what's really critical is that the program is really, it recognizes in a very deep way that we as human beings have an instinct to protect our children and that we need to leverage that, that instinct to promote adaptive behavioral change. If you ask parents, vulnerable parents, what matters most to them they'll say, I've got to protect my baby. And, and, uh, and nurses help them, these mothers say, and that also means you need to protect yourself. Um, one young mother um, visited by nurses was 17 when she first started receiving the, um, the service. She was living in the dirt basement of a, uh, an infested home she was, um, when the nurse started to get to know her, she revealed that she had harmed babies she was babysitting for. And it's good, only by the grace of God that these children didn't die. Sure, does that help? Do, I'm being asked to speak close, more closely to the microphone. I apologize, Can, is that working in the back? All right. Should I go back and repeat everything I just said? <laughs> um, this, this young mother, um, we, we, cre we created a community advisory board to support the program to address Yuri Bromferman as um, human eco ec ecological forces and tried to create a whole system of, of, uh, of social services and um, uh, health services to address the needs of this mother, uh, child, and fathers when they were involved. And so 
one of the things we did is we talked to uh, the nurse, in, um, uh, organized a meeting with the principal of the school this young mother was attending because the young mother was talking about dropping out of school. And the principal said, really, that would be so great. I'm so glad that she's planning to drop out of school because she's been so difficult. I'd just like to get rid of her. And the nurse, and the nurse said, but she has strengths. She has strengths. So the nurse was able to convince the principal to stick with her and to and help this young mother complete her education, graduate from high, uh, from high school. And I think it's what's really critical in all of this is that the program is based in caring and respect and looking for what the young mothers are doing well, not what they're, what they're doing poorly. And that helps build that sense of confidence on the part of the mothers at, and being able to um, address the challenges that they have to contend with. The Nurse Family Partnership is has three primary goals. The first is to improve the outcomes of pregnancy by helping women improve their prenatal health. And the second is to improve the child's subsequent health and development by helping parents provide more sensitive, responsive, growth-promoting care to the child in the first two years of the child's life. And the third is to improve parents' own health and economic self-sufficiency by helping them start to develop a vision for what life might be like and to start planning the timing of subsequent pregnancies so that they can focus on their, the care of their first child and to think about completing their educations and finding work, building a sense of growing self-efficacy and managing their lives. The program, as a, you'll be surprised by this, is, uh, is found, is really embedded in human attachment theory. Here's John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth, right? And it's also grounded in human ecology theory because it's not enough to just focus on parental behavior, but you need to put that behavior in larger context and help parents start to address those social material forces that compromise their ability to function well. And it's also built on Bandura's self-efficacy theory. It's one thing to know that sensitive responsive care and human ecology forces, human ecological forces affect parenting. But how do you make change? How do you support change? So the program is designed to help nurses and mothers establish small achievable objectives that, that matter to this mother and to build up a growing sense of self-efficacy by celebrating small changes, effective changes that help them get closer to their desired goals. And it's also grounded in developmental epidemiology. What do we know about forces in pregnancy and the early life of the child that impact the growth and development of the child. And this, of course, developmental epidemiology is growing and growing uh, all the time. So we need to use that information from epidemiology to deepen those conditions that need to be addressed to further um, strengthen the impact of the program. This slide gives you an overview of the um, how these elements come together. At the top box, you see there is this set of influences called prenatal health-related behaviors. And that's important because prenatal health-related behaviors like smoking and alcohol exposure or diet or chronic um, uh, disruptive toxic stress can have an influence on the, the developing fetus's neurodevelopmental integrity. Children exposed to those um, influences during pregnancy are more likely to be behaviorally dysregulated even in the first few days and months of life. And children who have those exposures are more um, irritable and fussy and difficult to regulate. And that means that the the effect of the program on parental caregiving 
is met with a child who is more easily soothed and provides uh, reinforcement to parents to feel like, ah, oh, I can do this because I can calm my child because that child has been less frequently exposed to those kinds of neurodevelopmentally compromising exposures. And then, of course, the effects of the program on parental life force, planning of subsequent pregnancies, thinking about the mother's relationship with her partner and other family members, uh, building a sense of, uh, of uh, economic self-sufficiency, avoidance of substance abuse on the part of the mother means that it's important because those factors affect mother's ability to provide effective care, but they also have a, a, an effect on the context that this child is exposed to throughout development. These factors will affect ch children's both neurodevelopmental functioning, both because of the prenatal effects, uh, the parenting effects, but also w this will have these influences will have long-term effects on things like educational achievement, antisocial behavior, substance abuse, and so forth. This program fundamentally is built on three principles. The first is clinical excellence. We need a program that is well-designed, that is really thoughtfully designed in terms of its clinical components. And this effort needs to be grounded in the very best science we can, we, can, uh, we can develop. And that means replicated, randomized clinical trials. And that also, and this is, a, uh, I think, a point that you're concerned about, Abby, we need to be accountable to ourselves and to those um, uh, policymakers and the families we serve to make sure that this is really working the way it was working in the original trials. We have to be accountable. So we've tested the program in Elmira, New York. I've already described that to some degree. Low-income, white, semi-rural community. Elmira included a small portion of women who did not have any of the soci sociodemographic risk characteristics used for participant recruitment. Um, and, um, and the findings were promising. So w the first question that we asked ourselves was, um, will this work with blacks living in a major urban area? So we replicated the program in Memphis, Tennessee, beginning in 1987, uh, with a sample of, of 1,138 participants followed during pregnancy, and 742 of them by design followed postnatally. And then after that, we conducted a third trial. Our team conducted a third trial in Denver, Colorado, begun in 1994, uh, that included a large portion of Latino families. And it systematically tested the relative effects of the program when delivered by nurses versus paraprofessionals because some people said to us, these nurses are, this is, this is all looking good, but you would get even better results if you were to use paraprofessionals. And we said, well, maybe that's right. Let's test it. Um, in all of these trials, our control group or comparison groups included those who were provided sensory and developmental screening services, like the service I was asked to evaluate in Elmira, plus in Elmira and Memphis, at least, free transportation for regular prenatal and well child care in all the groups. So it was, this is what happens above and beyond what you get when you facilitate families use of office-based care. Um, this slide shows the distributions of neighborhood disadvantage scores for in the Elmira, Memphis, and Denver trial. Notice that in Elmira and Denver, these two trials, the participants in these trials were um, living in neighborhoods that on average were just about exactly what all U.S. Um, neighborhoods um, look like in terms of their um, levels of disadvantage. But the Memphis participants were living in neighborhoods 
that were nearly two and a half standard deviations above the national mean. So these folks were living in really, really impoverished and often criminally, uh, criminally involved neighborhoods. Um, I've mentioned that we created this um, community advisory board for the Elmira trial. We registered 400 pregnant women, no previous live births, registered them relatively early in, in gestation. This was 89% of the sample was white. And um, as I mentioned, 15% were, did not have any of the sociodemographic characteristics used for sample recruitment. But critically, 48% of those enrolled in this program smoked cigarettes, five or more cigarettes per day at registration. Th that's a lot of cigarettes. And um, one of the things we found in the Elmira trial was that there were significant improvements in women's prenatal diet based on 48-hour diet records. And um, this is based on the qualities of their diet and that there were significant reductions in women's kidney infections in pregnancy. And this is associated with increases in the treatment of bladder infections because that's what nurses do. They identify symptoms of emerging health problems and make sure that they get treated. And the answer, the, the result of this is this reduction in kidney infec uh, infections. And there were corresponding reductions, important reductions in the number of cigarettes smoked per day um, at the end of, by the end of pregnancy. And we were able to use what was then a newly developed methodology for validating biochemically prenatal tobacco exposure using serum cotinine, which was just developed and we, were, and we did this on a small subsample of the um, El, Elmira trial. And we found that women in the at both nurses and comparison group families were equally inaccurate in reporting the numbers of cigarettes smoked at the end of pregnancy. But nurse, nurse visited families were substantially more accurate in their reports of cigarette smoking at the end of pregnancy. And that's because nurses are helping them. When do you have your, uh, talk with them. When do you have your first cigarette? When do you have that craving? Do you have the, do you, do you um, is it after dinner, or is it in the evenings? So, so the nurse visited mothers are thinking about, when is it that I'm smoking? So, and that's a principle, I think, that you'll see throughout these, these findings that I'll, I'll share with you in a moment. And there was a corresponding reduction in the number of, of um, preterm deliveries among women who smoked um, in the Elmira trial. Uh, and important for this conference, of course, through age two, there was a trend for a reduction in the rates of state verified reports of child abuse and neglect for women who had all three of the original sample characteristics used for recruitment. That is, they were poor, unmarried, and teens. Now, this is only a trend, and whatever difference looks like that's operating here for the sample as a whole is really driven by this much more dramatic pattern among those who are more vulnerable. By the way, this group, the gold group, was those visited by nurses during pregnancy alone. And even among those poor unmarried teens, the effects of the poor, uh, of, uh, on the prevention of child abuse and neglect was really concentrated among those poor unmarried teens who at registration had limited sense of control over their, their life circumstances. These are mothers with lower generalized self-efficacy. And it was this finding that led us to f strengthen our, our uh, emphasis on promoting self-efficacy. Self and you'll see in a moment other, other effects. By the time the children were 15, we see a significant treatment main effect on the rates of state verified reports of child abuse and neglect in the Elmira trial. Um, 
and there were significant reductions in the rates of uh, arrests. This is self-reported arrests among poor unmarried mothers in the Elmira trial. And there, by the time the children were 19, there were significant reductions in their self-reports of lifetime arrest through age 19. Most of this difference, almost all of it, was um, attributable to differences that emerged in arrest through age 15. These are children who are having early onset conduct disorder get, uh, that gets reflected in early um, um, arrests and other kinds of behavior problems. So, um, you know, if we have time, we'll dig into that later. And we found in the Elmira trial, among the mothers who were poor and unmarried, there was a significant increase in the interval between the birth of first and second children for the nurse, the group that received nurses during pregnancy in the first two years of the child's life compared to their counterparts in the control group. So the Memphis trial, as I mentioned before, focused on primarily black uh, sample 85% of those enrolled in the Memphis trial were living below the U.S. federal poverty guidelines. These folks were not only living in really poor neighborhoods, but they, were, they had to make decisions about whether they were going to buy milk or whether they were going to pay the rent. We're really poor. Um, so among the things that we discovered in planning the, the Memphis trial was that we did pretest and pilot work in the Elmire, or the Memphis community and discovered that the rates of state verified reports of child abuse and neglect in Memphis were far too low, only 3%, to serve as a viable, valid outcome measure in the Memphis trial. So we looked instead at other, what we consider to be even more objective indicators of child maltreatment. And this slide, Start, gives you some gives you some insight into this. There was a significant overall treatment control difference in the number of days that children were hospitalized with injuries. Okay, and if we look at the details, what we see here. By the way, there, there were twice as many families assigned to the control group as the nurse visited group in in the Memphis trial. We have three children who were hospitalized with injuries or ingestions in the first two years of the child's life in, um, in the Memphis trial. All of these ch children were aged 12 months or older. Um, two of them involved ingestions, and this other 12-month ch uh, child was crawling on his grandmother's bed where she had been ironing and picked up the iron and put it on his face. Okay, You can see the length of stay here. Here, is the cor here are the corresponding diagnoses and lengths of hospitalization among children in the control group in this sample. What's so striking is that we're dealing here with children with head trauma, bilateral subdural bleeding, fractured skulls, broken long bones, the kinds of conditions for children in this age range these children, up to eight months of age, are not mobile. They're not creating risk for themselves. How does all of this happen? Fractured skulls, broken long bones. It's, um, and look at the lengths of time that these children were hospitalized. H length of hospitalization is a clear indicator of the severity of trauma. Okay. And in the Memphis trial, we created an additional index to characterize mother's ability to cope with adversity. It's not only her self-efficacy, although that is a component of this scale we created called psychological resources. We also characterize their intellectual functioning and their mental health. And it's those mothers at the, in the lower half of the distribution in psychological resources where all of this, these effects 
that, were, that I showed you in the previous slide were concentrated. It was the mothers who were least capable of coping with adversity based on a, on, on a combined index of what I just described to you that shows where the benefits for this intervention are most pronounced. Let's keep that in mind. Uh, by the time the children were age six, um, if, you t if we split the sample at the median, and we, uh, what we essentially found was that there was a reduction in the children's dysregulated aggression revealed in story stems that they told the interviewers, where does that come from? How does that reduction in, in, in um, dysregulated ag uh, aggression come from? And there's a corresponding reduction in incoherent responses to these, to the children's, to these open-ended story stems. We also see a significant reduction in the, um, or increase in the intervals between births of first and second children. So it's in alignment with the model. Uh, by the time the children were two, we see a significant reduction in the children's use of tobacco, alcohol, or marijuana during the 30-day period before the interview. Significant reduction in sub early substance use. And at the same time, the children had significant reductions in, in depression and anxiety at age 12. And by age 18, there was a, a significant improvement in directly measured children's receptive vocabulary or language functioning by age 18. But it was limited to children born to the mothers who had limited psychological resources, those who were most vulnerable. That group that was um, most vulnerable. And corresponding increases in directly measured math achievement by the time the children were 18, limited to those children born to mothers least capable of coping with adversity. And for the sample as a whole, there was an increase in children's graduation from high school with honors. And based on mother's report, there was a significant reduction in children's um, disability Supplemental Security Income. It's a federal designation in the U.S. for disability. Uh, again, limited to those children who were born to the mothers least capable of coping with adversity. So, in Denver, we recruited the sample of 45% Latina. Um, all of the participants were living below the federal poverty, 133% of the federal poverty guidelines, 23% uh, smoked cigarettes at registration. Um, at the time, we began this study in 1994, um, qualification for Medicaid, which is the public health source of um, reimbursement for health services in the U.S. was 133% of poverty. Keep that in mind. Um, and overall, this is basically what we found, that nurses produced effects that were roughly twice, twice as large as the, the paraprofessional visited uh, families. And, it's, and critically, I'll just mention this, uh, families actually opened the doors more frequently for nurses. And even if you control statistically for the amount of service received, nurses still produced greater effects because I think it's, it's a reflection of nurses' training and their ability to bring together all of these sources of influence on maternal and child health. So... Here, we were able to uh, uh, use uh, urine cotinine as a way of measuring tobacco use. And we see there is a significant reduction in urine cotinine for the nurse visited group, not for the paraprofessional visited group compared to the, those in the control condition. By the time the children were age four, we see significant improvements in children's language scores uh, for the nurse visited group not for the 
uh, paraprofessional group, but it's getting there, isn't it? Um, and um, by the time the children were four, we had created uh, a, me a synthesis of different components of intellectual functioning to characterize executive functioning. And what we found was that the nurse visited group produced effects that were um, substantially better than their counterparts in the control group for those in the low psychological resource group. And the paraprofessional group was also a significant difference, but not as large as the, the nurse visited group. We see by the time children from ages four, six, and nine, when we combined all of these ages, we found that, um, that there were increases in the children's capacity for sustained attention um, in, the, in those children born to the, um, the low psychological resource group and who were nurse visited. And in the Memphis trial, we found that there were significant increases in the intervals between the uh, timing of first subsequent birth for the nurse visited group compared to the control group. And again, the paraprofessional group fell right in between. Okay. Now, um, this slide reflects a recent publication that we've produced looking at the rates of maternal mortality for external causes. Thank you. For external causes. And um, what we see is that there are trends for both the uh, Elmira and or uh, Memphis and Elmira and Denver trials to have reductions. When we combine these two groups, it sits right on the borderline of statistical significance. And for the children, we see that there is, in the control group, um, the, uh, this slide shows the rates of preventable cause mortality in the nurse visited group, the control group. This difference had been statistically significant. This child was murdered in a parking lot and the difference became a trend, nothing in the Elmira and Denver trials. And look at how low those rates are nationally, okay? Um, so we, based on these findings, we decided that we needed to replicate the program outside of research settings. And we've emphasized these core things. We need to make sure that organizations and communities are well prepared to deliver the program. We need to make sure we get warm, caring nurses. We need excellent education and consultation, well-developed program guidelines, an information system that's integrated right into the delivery of the program with a focus on continuous quality improvement. We've replicated the program in other societies, including uh, the UK, Australia, Canada, Norway, Bulgaria, with American Indians and Alaskan Natives, in, um, we've done work in the Netherlands and Germany. They were not continued. Uh, I, if we have time, I'll explain why. The, the Dutch conducted a randomized clinical trial shown here that reproduced many of the essential elements of findings from the US trials. Uh, the English conducted their own large-scale randomized clinical trial of the program, and if the findings were disappointing. But it's beautifully executed, but there was a challenge with design. And the problem is that it was what's called open label. In, the sense, in this sense, all of the existing health visitors and midwives in England knew which families were assigned to the control group. They were given a list. These are the families in the control group. So what do you think they're gonna do? It's important for us to keep that in mind. And by the way, these findings are being reanalyzed right now. There has been a, uh, a, another randomized trial conducted in British Columbia that has shown significant reductions in uh, the, the, the number of cigarettes smoked and cannabis use during pregnancy, and the postnatal findings are imminent. And that means within days in the Journal of Child Psychology and Psychiatry. Um, so keep your eyes open for this. 
There was a large, very large trial of the program in the US that um, was conducted using administrative data and there were no effects on reported on pregnancy outcomes. Birth weight, uh, preterm delivery, small for gestational age, perinatal um, mortality. But it's critically important to understand that this trial focused on women who were Medicaid eligible. And that means in the US today, about 200% of poverty, half of the US births in, um, in uh, today are to women who qualify for Medicaid. That's not the population that needs the program. This is your, your point, Abby. It's, um, but you know something, we need to learn from this. We need to be, we need to pay attention because these results, these disappointing results, lead us to reshape how we're going to go about conducting replication of this program. Uh, we've, th we have a model for innovating the program. Uh, we have improved, uh, set in, in, tr in motion of various randomized clinical trials and uh, quasi-experimental studies of innovations in the program. Most importantly today, Mandy Allison, who co-directs our center at the University of Colorado, has just received NIH funding to conduct a trial, a randomized trial, for women who've had previous live births. So, fingers crossed. So finally, I love this quote. And I think, you know something? Um, you can go fast. But if you want to go further, we need to work together. And um, I just want to say very briefly that I have, I've had wonderful nurses I've had the opportunity to work with over the course of my career. And I'm just going to mention their names. Georgie McGrady in the Elmira trial, such a force. Harriet Kitzman, a wonderful nurse educator and researcher who helped refine and integrate this program model into nursing. Pilar Baca, who was one of the, who was the supervisor of nurses in the Denver trial, helped deepen the clinical operations of the program. And Ellie Yost, who's taken this program and helped ensure its clinical integrity as it gets replicated outside of, um, outside of research settings. So thank you all very much. Now, remember that I've got this hearing problem, so either yell or just I'll cut on Abby to help me out. <laughs> So Abby, I, I'm I'm I, I, I'm so sorry that I couldn't understand a thing you've just I, I, said. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, sort of, is it is it the question about how you make the program accessible? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
This is a neighborhood daycare center in Baltimore. Did you all get the question? Okay. Um, it was conducted, this was a neighborhood conduct, um, daycare center so people could walk to the center. So uh, transportation was not an issue. Um, and virtually all of the, the mothers in this program were unemployed. So employment did not really interfere with their ability to show up. So I guess you would have to say that what we did was we tried to create a warm, inviting setting. And, um, and what we wanted to make sure was that we were speaking to them about their children, about their children's needs, individual needs. And one of the things that struck me was the parents who showed up were so engaged and loving, and, and it's quite, quite remarkable. Um, so, um, you know, that's, that's about it. We know, and um, I think that um, I'm sure there are ways of doing this. And even in today's environment where you have uh, most parents are using daycare, all, I shouldn't say most, but a very large portion are working. So having access to these kinds of parent support groups is uh, very challenging. Could be done in the evening. Um, I couldn't do that. But there are lots of ways of making it more accessible. So thank you. Thank you for that question. Are there other questions? I would give out of the... Okay. All right. Thanks. <laughs> Here, try this. Okay. I, I'm going to repeat it because I think it's a really important question. It's about coaching and support for the nurses. So when you go to implementation, right, what's crucial, of course, is that the nurses are well trained and yeah. supported because it's burnout work, right? Yeah. Thank you. That's so important. That's a great question. Um, two things. One of them is that the the, all of the supervisors in the program are taught reflective supervision techniques, okay? And that the model, which actually was begun in El, the Elmira trial, we would hold weekly meetings of nurses where they could, ref, they could share their stories, their insights, the challenges they were experiencing. And in the Elmira trial, the nurses were paired with one another. So there was a primary nurse, and a secondary nurse who was there to back her up and to be able to discuss the needs of, of Susie while at the, at the water cooler having a cup of coffee. All of that was important. It's been, f that model of having paired nurses has not been replicated. And I think it needs to be, we need to think that through some more. But the idea is to build a culture, a culture of support and respect within the organization and also within communities. There's real value if healthcare providers know these nurses and trust them and, um, and nurses feel affirmed in their roles. So there are many different ways in which that support for nurses can be communicated. And look, I, I think that, you know, the, the, as the program has grown in the U.S., it's, um, um, it's serving something like 55,000 families in the U.S. per year. Um, we need to do more to address that issue. So, but thank you for that question. It's, 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 it's being able to ensure that kind of ongoing support replicated at scale Something we got to work on.
Yeah, so, so, so I think the question uh, is about um, it, what go, what's beyond the simple uh, time to get your immunizations or, you know, you shouldn't be smoking. Um, so, I, and, and I think your point about what happens in Israel is you're talking about like tipat chalav, that the parents go and they have, a, they, they have regular checkups, which is what happens in the United States as well. But this is slightly different because in Israel, I believe the nurse does not visit the home, right? So there's the addition of the home visits and also the relationship. I think the question is about, so what's the added extra? Oh, yeah. I'm so, again, yeah, thank you for those great questions. You know, I, um, it all boils down to the nurse's relationship with this mother and building trust. And that means that nurses really need to be reflective and caring and non-judgmental. And, um, and that means at the replication stage, we collectively need to hire the right nurse for this job. This is not a job for just any nurse. This is a job for nurses who are committed to serving the purpose that all of us in this room are committed to, who feel a sense of um, broader purpose in life. I've had nurses come to me and say, you know, I've been in nursing for 20 years, but when I found this program, I finally felt like it spoke to me this is what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. Those are the nurses we need to hire. Those, and they're out there. We just need to be more intentional about making sure that, that we get them and support them well in their, in their communities, in their organizations, within their teams. So another great insight, thank you. Yes. Uh, as, as you know, uh, many of the nurses are uh, reliant professionals, and this is why it's hard to scale them up. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the use of power professionals? Yeah, uh, you know, we, we worked in the Denver trial with uh, local organizations that were providing um, paraprofessional home visitors, and we asked those organizations to send us to in the very best paraprofessional visitors they had. So we were concerned about some of these very um, interpersonal skills that we're talking about right now. And um, um, I think the key thing is that, look, we have very caring, very caring paraprofessionals. I mean, I sat in the office where the, the, both of those sets of teams were, were working. I know these people. And, um, and, we, and we doubled the, the levels of, of clinical supervision for the paraprofessionals to make sure that they, compared to what nurses got. Because we wanted to give this the very best shot. Um, the um, I think the key thing is that, two things. One of them is, at least in the U.S., nursing is the most widely um, trusted profession, even more than lawyers. <laughs> and... Um, The, 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 uh, and on top of this, what I grew to appreciate, I didn't know this at the beginning, was that nursing education creates all the way back to Florence and Nightingale has been thinking about the, the whole person, the whole person in context, understanding all of these what we call ecological forces and personal forces and health forces that conspire to undermine health and development, or support it. And nurses are, are trained in those, that way of thinking to, um, 
that aligns with this model. So thank you. Thank you for your great questions. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Thank you. Thank you so much, David and AB. And uh, now we'll move into uh, the prize in the memory of Professor Gary Melton. Um, this is the first year that Chorov Institute is dedicated a prize for Professor Gary Melton, uh, who we lost two years ago. Professor Gary Melton was a leading scholar in the fields of child abuse and protection of children's rights. He played a revolutionary role in the improvement of safeguarding policy for children. He was a pioneer, an inspiration, and a light in our community, who embraced and promoted themes of justice, inclusion, dignity, and respect in everything that he did. Um, so I'm very honored to, uh, to invite again David and Abby and Asher uh, to be with me in this pride because you are the international pioneers and champions uh, for the prevention. It wasn't planned, but I want to say something. I think the last time I met David was in the International Conference of Haruv in Tulsa, Oklahoma, together with Gary Melton. He was there also. Gary was a very dear and personal friend of mine and an innovator, especially in the area of prevention of child abuse and neglect, and a dear friend of the Haruv Institute, who helped not only hosted three of our postdocs, but also helped us in various programs, and we are honored. It's not the only event we are doing in his memory, uh, but it's one of a series of events we are doing in, in his honor, and I think there is nobody better than him to be to be given an award on his recognition and his contribution for the prevention of child maltreatment. So this year, winner of the prize is Dr. Ohad Green. Dr. Ohad Green. <laughs> for his child abuse prevention program, the Parenting Life for Lifelong Health Parent up. So, Had, please join us. And we will hear. Congratulations, Ohad. And now we will have a short time to hear from Ohad about the reason for this prize. You've all seen my nice shirt. Now I will cover it so I won't be appearing now. Great. So, um, okay. I, I'm uh, a little bit hectic in my presentation. I will move a lot. So, okay. Um, okay. So, before I will cut, I will start my my uh, countdown timer. Uh, first of all, I wish to thank again for you for inviting me here. Um, you know, I feel it's a great privilege, and actually, I feel a bit. Um, um, uncomfortable to be the only one who uh, who is here on the stage today because this work is the work of so many researchers, students, and and you know, and, and families. Uh, they should get this. They should be here in uh, with with me today. And you know, when I submitted my abstract to the uh, to the conference, I was uh, I thought I will present uh, uh, our. The, the project in that we worked on very hard in last years uh, s uh, uh, 
No, my, my, my special dream of, of uh, developing an online intervention, a free and open source online positive parenting um, intervention. But when I won the prize, and I, uh, I, I will say that actually I will be speaking in front of all of you, I said it's, it's quite, it will be a little bit of a waste of time of talking about the past, because you now we can read about it in papers, policy briefs. I mean, it's important for me also to talk about the future, to share with you my vision of the future uh, uh, of digital uh, uh, positive parenting programs. And this is what I will do in the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Let me start my countdown timer. Uh, mm. Oh. Okay, so um, yeah, as I said, you know, uh, I will present for you today the, my vision of the future digital programs, um, and I, I want I, I don't call them uh, digital programs; I call them uh, parenting immunotherapy, and you will understand in a minute why. So, in general, uh, you know, parenting programs uh, are are seen by scholars as they call them the parenting vaccine. And this is because their ability to create this societal shield against child abuse. They empower parents. They give them positive parenting tools. They mitigate this destructive, um, you know, parenting stress. And, and, and this is how, uh, you know, they build those strong relationships between, between parents and children. And this is how child abuse is prevented. However, the, for the same reason that we couldn't, you know, reach, uh, 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 it took so much time to reach, uh, you know, population herd immunity uh, uh, during COVID, uh, this is the reason uh, why parenting programs, they are not reaching uh, all the parents who, who need them. It's the cost of the implementation and, and, and training and the reliance on, uh, uh, mainly on uh, professionals. And about 10 years ago, those two, two uh, problems started to be solved because a group of researchers and students and, and NGOs and governments came together and created Parenting for Lifelong Health, or PLH as, as we call it, uh, where I am part of, and uh, developed and tested hand in hand with, with, with families a suite of parenting, positive parenting in-person programs uh, around the world, especially for low middle uh, uh, income countries, low research settings, and this means those, those programs were developed and, and uh, scaled up for, for free. They're, they're really free to, to use. They're open sourced. Uh, they are relied on power professionals, on people from the community who get training. And you know, you don't need a venue, you don't need elect electricity to, to, to run them. All you need is, is pen and paper. Um, and actually, this is uh, this worked uh, uh, quite well because more than 15, I think seven, 17, randomized control trials proved their effectiveness and, and cost effectiveness not only in like slashing child abuse rates, but also in other uh, uh, like like, um, like 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 we saw uh, a few minutes ago in other um, other other domains of well-being and, and, and health. Yet, the problem was that, you know, like in vaccines, you know, it's a parenting program is not a one-off thing. You need to come again and again and again. Some of the programs are eight sessions, 10 sessions, 12 sessions, and not all the parents can, can, can handle this. I mean, I mean, not all the parents can commit to this weekly two or three hour uh, uh, meetings. You know, sometimes they, they come from far away, especially in, 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 in uh, you know, in low income countries going back to their houses when it's late and dark and, and, and it's, it's, it's frightening to be outside. And then I realized in 2017, I was a very young postdoc in, uh, thanks to, to Harub, I was a very young postdoc at uh, the University of Oxford. Uh, and I had this idea, um, this innovative yet utterly unrealistic idea of taking the in-person uh, a program called Sinovuyo, it's in the Kosa language, it's a South African language called Kosa, and uh, 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 Sinovuyo means we have joy, and create, transfer Sinovuyo into Sinovuyo online. Um, and uh, it was really unrealistic and was unanimously rejected by my supervisors back then. 
However, two years later, they invited me, they called me from the US and said, Ohad, you're right, L let's do it. And this is what we did in the last years. We developed hand in hand with service users, with families. This is from a workshop I ran in South Africa. A, a digital parenting program, a free, open sourced, soon to be uh, evidence based, it's under uh, randomized control trial now, a parenting app accessible to any parent uh, everywhere. And it's called Parent App. Um, it's not my idea of the uh, name. Um, anyhow, the program itself includes all of the good things we have in the in person program. Uh, it got, you know, all the basics of establishing very uh, a warm and, and close relationships with your children, going through an emerging stress and house rules. Also, we have, you see, uh, I, I, won't, I won't touch something that will, anyhow. You see, uh, there is also a um, family budgeting um, a module because it's very important for in lower research settings. It's something new that, that was that was added I as part of PLH in general. We all of all, all, all of those things, and each week parents can get a new a new session. Uh, they have also um, you know an area called the parent library where they can get other resources or get some advanced uh, uh, summary of the modules. Because if 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 a parent want uh, uh, they need you now they they are overwhelmed. They need how need tips how to deal with parental stress, we can say to them, okay, this will be unlocked in five weeks. So they have those, those, those as well. However, as a social worker and as a facilitator, it was, th th what I'd said until now, it's not what makes Parent Up so unique. What is makes it so special is, uh, and this is what's very important for me as a social worker and a facilitator, to create this, uh, maybe this said it uh, a, few, a few minutes ago, this, you know, this, we call it like the holding environment, this cherishing, this togetherness environment, environment as part of the app. Uh, you know, I, I didn't have the privilege to, to know and work with, with Gary, but from what I have read and heard, he had this vision of every parent have someone, you know, to, to rely on, someone to share good things and bad things. And this is exactly what we did in, in, in Parent App. I mean, they get so much positive attention. They get they get you know, uh, messages of empowering messages every day, even if they failed, especially if they failed. They, they, can, they can track their own progress on, 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 on different, different parenting domains, and we keep reminding them their successes when they, f when they failed. I mean, there can be a wonderful week. A week afterwards, you, 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 you feel you're like, like the worst parent in the world, and, and, and you need something to remind you, hey, okay, this, w this week was, was awful, but lo look what, what happened last week. There is also a lot of, we, we stress a lot about self-care because, you know, like, you know, we are going to an airplane and, and, and they say to you, put your mask on your face before you're putting it, you know, on your child. You know, we can't peer from an empty cup. So, so this is a new, uh, a new um, a, a module as part of, the, of, of this workshop about, about the caregiver well-being. And there is also something that we call, uh, not something, I mean, I mean Parents can also create their own small parenting groups with neighbors, with friends. Uh, this also solves the problem of you no, know, not not everybody got smartphone, phone, not smartphone in low middle income countries. Uh, so can, they can do it together. And they can share experiences. They can support each other. We also have trialing, you know, um, if you don't know, I will, I will tell you now. Um, we also have trialing, uh, you know, WhatsApp groups and and and, uh, f and phone calls from facilitators, you know, just to you know for those who really need this. So this is, for me, this is the heart of the program. So Parent Up is great. It's, I really do feel that this is the, the future of, this is the, will be hopefully the future global parenting vaccine. However, now we'll say something that will, uh, uh, like, a year ago I realized that I am going the wrong way. I need to do the complete opposite, okay, 180% round, turn around, because I realized that, you know, the, the, the problem, you know, <laughs> vaccine, you know, this is going to possibly be like a global parenting vaccine, but, you know, uh, parents, you know, got different needs. You can't compare the needs of, of a family when the fa father or mother suffers from PTSD to the needs, the, the parenting journey of a, of a family that, that got a, a child with special educational needs. And we and Parent Up will give everyone yeah, like the same the same program and and and, and it's wrong. 
and we need to tailor it better for, for them, to, that they really, every, each and every one of the parents will feel the parent app was created for him. And, and you know, uh, uh, actually I, I, I'm not say same, saying things that are new. I mean, I mean, there are today some very good, uh, 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 you know, programs for, uh, uh, for specific, uh, specific uh, um, uh, populations, but parent app will enable us to put everything and create more content I'll talk about it in, in a minute, and allow every parent to get the specific tailored program he needs. So how we'll do it? There are three, three layers for, 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 for my vision. This is exactly my, my vision, how I, can, how I see Parent App in, in 10 years from now, or five. The first is, you know, Parent App will soon be uh, at um, scale up, you know, population scale up in hundreds of thousands of uh, family in, 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 in the global south. This means, this means that we'll have enormous amount of data, anonymous data, usage data, uh, uh, outcomes data of, of all of those families. And we'll be able to understand, to do some of those very sophisticated modeling and understand what works for who. Uh, you know, what is the, we call it like the sweet point of one-on-one -on -one time? How many, it's funny to say that, but, but still, how many, pr what is the minimal number of daily praises you need to give for your child? You know, who are the parents who can use this, no, this is an app, this, this, this self-led app, and who needs the, this, this impersonal uh, uh, program? Who are the people, who are the families who, who, can, who can enjoy this, this, the, those mini uh, parenting groups uh, and, and can enjoy the, the WhatsApp groups and, and who needs the phone calls? This, will, this is like, um, like a gold, uh, gold mine of, of, of data, which will allow us to tailor and, 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 and optimize parent app even more, so this is the first layer. The second layer is, you know, in, when you run digital programs, it means that it needs to be evolving all the time. You don't, you can't just, you know, download an app, you know, and, 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 and that's it. You need to update it constantly, and especially with parenting, because parenting is not happening, you know, in isolation of what's happening uh, outside. So, in my vision, uh, uh, we are uh, creating an and you know, in streaming content to parents, you know, as things happen, you know, th there is this school uh, school uh, ends in in two in two uh, in two months. Let's send parents, you know, hey, this is parent app. Here are a few tips to, to prevent you know uh, injuries ho at home and and, and 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 outside. Okay, or or uh, for young postdocs in the U.S. who arrives and then they hear uh, hurricane alarms. Uh, here's what you can. Uh, here's what you, you you can do. Okay, so this is another thing that we need to do. The third part, and this is uh, this is why I present this for you today because uh, this is where each and every one of you uh, hopefully will take part, is the, the what I uh, uh, talked about uh, a few a, a few minutes ago. We need to take the content of parent app and tweak it a little bit to uh, reflect the special needs of, of, of parents according to their needs, if they're like, as I said, PTSD, or, or, or parents, for example, if, if their children suffer from any, any uh, medical or, or, um, or mental health condition or their own, or, or, or they're suffering from something, um, we need to create those very, very, very uh, uh, different, you know, different, uh, different programs, dozens of, of, of programs, hundreds of programs, and we can do it. And how we'll know uh, which parents need what? There will be a short, question, short or long questionnaire at, at the beginning of the app for who, whoever parents wants to 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 you know to fill this. And after he fills the questionnaire, we will be able to tailor this this intervention um, for for every, every one of them. And when we will do those three things, when we have this this massive uh, massive um, you know data. And those, th those, uh, this, this, uh, keeping parent up evolving all the time, and those dozens of, of, of uh, and maybe hundreds of different tweaks uh, uh, of, of parent up. This will, uh, at this moment, parent up won't be anymore a global vaccine. It will be a tailored immunotherapy. This is where, you know, medical science goes. This is where social science and prevention science needs to go. And this is, uh, uh, this is my aim. Lastly. Um, you know, one of the reasons that I was, I was uh, so, uh, um, um, I'm so happy to share this with you is because in the last years I, I, I learned that, uh, you know, 
if as you know, your project will be successful, you know, there's, a, there's a positive correlation between the number of people on that are, are your partners and the success of the project. I need every one of you, okay? Uh, it does, I mean, I mean, I, there are like here, like the, the researchers, policymakers, you know, there are here students here who uh, get some wonderful posters out there, which I started to read, which, be, which will be our future leaders. Um, you really, really, really need, I mean, I mean, really need everyone, and I really want to do it. This is why I, I wrote this, this uh, email. I mean, I have a few, but this one uh, that I'm proud the most. It's really important for me personally to do it here uh, in, in, in Israel. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's really important to me. So hopefully uh, in the next, uh, uh, I will wait a few minutes for your emails uh, or tomorrow. Uh, but please, please join me on this. Be, please, please be part of this. I mean, this is how science evolves. This is how I evolve. We always, you know, we, we, get, we get knowledge from, from people we worked with and we, we, we give it back and, 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 and you will continue. Yeah. That's it, thank you.